last week in the episode that we did, yes. uh, that we might have uh, David Matthews here from RevTech Ventures. But I'll let David go ahead and introduce himself. Uh, he's got a very interesting background, and I think uh, we're going to have a great time. So hi, David. Welcome to The Retail Perch. Hello, Shaker, and hello, Gary. Uh, thank you for having me join you. And I am not a presidential candidate, so nobody should have any anxiety whatsoever. <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> so but david it'd be to your great. guy next week whoever he may be that's right that's right so uh so david really quickly if you can give us uh you know kind of a bird's eye view of uh, your background how you got to where you are today and uh would be great so uh, so shaker i started out as an entrepreneur same as you uh i started out you know it, it was funny the same day I started the MBA program at SMU. I started a startup venture with two partners. And, um, and uh, lo and behold, it took off like a rocket ship. And, um, and this company, it was a part-time while I was doing a full-time MBA, but it very quickly became full-time. Uh, I did um, meeting and event services for uh, new products and brands, uh, both technology and retail. And, um, the uh, first million dollar customer of this company was J.C. Penney, who had just moved from New York to Dallas. Sorry for your region, Shaker, but it was good news for Dallas back then. Now, not so much so. J.C. Penney declared bankruptcy this year. <laughs> um, but even as an entrepreneur, I really was operating more like a venture capitalist because I worked with two brothers. One was the operator, one was the marketer, and I was kind of the glue that like held it all together and kept it from exploding. Uh, I helped recruit in talent, I helped build processes, I helped raise capital, and uh, and really that role as an entrepreneur working with two entrepreneurs, what I realized during the course of that venture was um, I was basically a venture capitalist. So I graduated from that, sold my interest in that company, had a good outcome, and I became a venture capitalist. At the same time, my um, wife's family office uh, were control investors in an arts and crafts chain called Michael's Arts and Crafts. And they were also control investors in a technology company called Sterling Commerce, which was an early e-commerce platform connecting uh, suppliers with retailers. Um, so, um, so I had a lot of connection into retail and technology uh, through my own experience as an entrepreneur and through this family office. So as I became a full-on venture capitalist a few years later, um, a few years into it with some pattern matching, I realized everything I was doing that was working involved retail and technology. So, uh, so around um, 2010 or 11, I just decided to focus completely and totally on retail tech as a category. So that's kind of a short story of how I got to where I am now with RevTech. With, we just did our 50th investment last week, by the way. So wow. congratulations. Congratulations. Down. That's fantastic. That's terrific. So, uh, wow, that's, that's really interesting. So you've been an entrepreneur pretty much all your life right out of college and haven't really gone the route. I mean, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, I, I would guess, have, you know, if they didn't start something out of college, uh, probably worked in the corporate world, maybe had an idea and then started off. So, you know, that's a pretty unique background. So David, you, you've probably seen, you know, you've, you've had your 50th investment. That obviously means that you have seen a lot more than 50 companies <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> right. and then looked at more and more than 50 deals. At least a hundred uh, deals for every one we've invested in. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. So you've obviously seen an awful lot and it'd be really interesting to see your perspective. I mean, obviously this year has been like no other year in, in many ways. Uh, so is there anything that stood out about this year with, with everything that's going on that was different from previous years? Oh, big time. Just looking at portfolio, I want you to imagine a quadrant, uh, a grid with the four quadrants and, um, and your x-axis going across here is um, online versus offline sales. And your y-axis up and down is um, essential versus non-essential as deemed for who stayed open and who had to close. 
And uh, what we found with our portfolio was um, thankfully and gratefully about three fourths of our portfolio fell in the essential and online e-commerce enabled uh, oh. quadrant, including bird's eye. Thank you. Uh, but about a fourth of our portfolio fell in that bottom left quadrant, which was deemed non-essential and mostly physical in store. So think like apparel store, technology in an apparel store, not good. Um, so this year was a real separator between essential and e-commerce enabled and non-essential and physically uh, operating only. If you're in that category, you're dead. If you're in the other category, you actually did better than you expected to do this year. Wow, wow, wow. You know, I mean, in some ways, I do feel sorry for people who got left out and got, you know, I think it got exposed in that, that uh, and we just hope they recover and rebound. Uh, but uh, off the company, so if, off the deals that you're looking at right now, David, and, and I'm guessing you've gotten a good view into, uh, uh, well, let me say, uh, you know, depression proofed uh, uh, companies, right? So companies that you feel are going to be able to weather the storm no matter what it is. And like you talked about the essential and digital that's a that's a deadly combination, you know. Uh, and I guess going forward, you see that you see that growing. Do you see that stagnating, hitting a new normal? Or what do you what do you see? I, I see everybody is going to be striving toward essential and e-commerce side of the equation, and away from non-essential and and uh, and physical store only. Wow! Even grocery, the world you guys live in. Yeah. Uh, made strides beyond what anyone would have believed in their wildest imagination for e-commerce adoption in 2020. Well, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. what Gary, we were like, I mean, you want to squeeze of... the eight grapefruits and, and smell the whatever, you know, you want to pick it up and touch it. <laughs> Maybe not. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it may not be worth it anymore. That's true. No, you might I die. Would... <laughs> we, we, we've certainly seen e-commerce, you know, as you know, explode across the whole grocery sector this year uh, with a lot of retailers, you know, looking at double, triple. I've talked to companies that have even seen, you know, five and six fold increases in their online business. And I, I think we're seeing that in other sectors. Right. And, and David, would you agree with that as you have a view into other retail verticals? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Wow. Uh, and, and with that growing digital business, um, what do you think it takes to, as a solution provider, so companies, you know, that you may look at or invest in, what does it take to, to survive and, and really thrive in this new environment? I, I think it's pure adaptability. And, but also I would caveat to that, not just having something for the current moment because uh, the current moment will pass. So I, I, I've seen at least two portfolio companies in our portfolio uh, change their physical non-essential store technology model to uh, one that more fits the COVID-19, like sterilizing, making environment safe model. And I think I don't like that because I think that's a very temporary adjustment it's not like seeing the big picture it's mm -hmm. seeing the the very you know small momentary picture so i i think it's important to adapt and adjust to current market reality uh, but by the way market reality hadn't really changed the path to uh, more e-commerce and uh and um more and more toward automation and personalization has been a trend line for years. It just accelerated this year. Yeah. I, it's not I, like it suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It was already there and growing. It just accelerated. Right. Yeah. And I, I that's exactly right. So, so what are some of the other exciting areas you're seeing of, of new innovation? What are some of the new things you're looking at and, and maybe considering? Yeah. Yeah thought about that, Gary, and I really boiled it down to two categories for us. Um, one category is, and, and they both start with the letter A, A U T. Uh, one is automation. Uh, automation is a huge category. 
and the other is authenticity. Um, so with automation, we have a couple portfolio investments that are exploding in their growth this year. One is Excel Robotics out of San Diego that has a touch-free commerce model competing with Amazon Go to where you can tag into a store with your mobile device, click in, go in, grab whatever you want and leave, you're done. Um, Excel Robotics is, um, is gonna close on probably $100 million of growth funding early next year. Uh -huh. um, um, so the, the, the thought of being able to clock into a store without touching anything and to grab whatever you want on the shelf into your bag you brought with you and leave is uh, very appealing. And that is going to just continue scaling massively. The other on automation is Pensa Systems out of Austin. Uh, they're, they're using a system of uh, using machine vision for uh, inventory management of grocery store shelves. And they're doing it both with drones, interestingly, and with uh, human beings with uh, mobile devices walking up and down aisles. Uh, but with machine vision, they're able to drive a 99% efficiency improvement in uh, on-shelf inventory management for grocery. Wow. And, and these guys are a billion dollar company in the making. They're, they're growing exponentially and they're raising capital massively at this point. So that's automation side. And then authenticity side is the other one. And the citizenry is a uh, direct to consumer company we invested in five years ago. Um, you have to be positioned right in a COVID type year, but, um, the citizenry uh, designs and sources home goods, uh, uh, home decor products around the world. And, uh, and they are 100% uh, guaranteed to be a fair labor standard for every single product they sell. And they sell almost a thousand products at this point. They're the largest company in the world that can certify 100% fair labor across the board. Hmm. So, there's a great example of authenticity and their growth has exploded this year because people are locked up at home, looking around their home and seeing they need more uh, home decor right. items. Um, and then the other one is called bird's eye. Um, you guys know a little about bird's eye, but bird's eye is all about really understanding the customer and telling them what they want to hear about and not what they don't want to hear about and taking it a step further and telling them what they want to hear about coupled with what their goals are. Um, that's huge, absolutely huge. And, and, uh, and you know, check every box on authenticity. But, but those are the two things, automation and authenticity, I think. I want to throw in here. The other day, my wife comes to me with her phone and she says, I really like this sofa uh, and this uh, centerpiece that they have here and uh, on Pinterest and I, and I look at this and I say, this is citizenry. I know I recognize this. <laughs> and, uh, she, says, and nice. she says, I love it. I follow them on Instagram. I follow them on Pinterest and she's a big fan of citizenry. And uh, you know, I mean, we can have a chat about this later to see if the founder can get us a discount. Thank you. Citizenry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sidebar You're in the midst of a, a huge growth round right now. And I think you're going to hear a lot more of them next year because they're, um, they're, they're really scaling fast at this point. Wow. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So, uh, I mean, so coming, coming from, you know, obviously it's cool to have a great solution, but you know, some of these startups, they uh, must have pretty well set models of figuring out how to onboard retailers. I mean, it seems like some, somebody like a Pensa systems or Axel robotics uh, is infrastructure heavy requires, you know, uh, some degree of onboarding. Uh, what, 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 what do you think uh, you know, most of these enterprises have in terms of being able to generate and keep that pipeline moving and keep retailers interested because they're probably writing big checks for some of these solutions? Well, it's, I mean, it's really two simple things, Shaker. One, one is clear proof of concept. So the beautiful thing about retail tech is if you can prove an ROI in one store uh, with great indisputable data of the before and after scenario of what things, how things improve with your solution. You can easily comprehend scaling that solution from one store to a hundred thousand stores. Uh, that's the beauty of retail tech. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, 
not so beautiful thing about retail tech is how slow things seem to move through retail systems. Yeah. So the other part is to really construct a machine, a, a machine to where I did the value proposition proceeds down a conveyor belt and customers either get on board or they don't. <laughs> but, right. but to really have that kind of KPI dashboard uh, of metrics to drive, you know, from a first meeting of a customer to, uh, to proof of concept, to implementation, to full deployment, to retention. Um, so the other side, and that's, you know, where the real heavy lifting is, is just building a scalable machine. But the other part is relatively simple. Prove a concept in one store where it has indisputable and incredible return on investment. Right. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, if there's people out there listening, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, I mean, that's fantastic advice. I think, you know, there's nothing like seeing, uh, showing the retailer how your system actually works in their store, as opposed yeah. to just a bunch of slides and PowerPoints and demos that you can take them through. Right. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's the yeah, same. When they go from were, making, yeah. you know, a thousand dollars to making five thousand dollars on something, whatever that thing is. Right. That's right. going to get their attention. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. David, what are some of the things, you know, beyond not those couple items we just talked about, what are some of the things you look for in the, the team uh, of companies you decide to invest in? On team, Gary, it's really two, two things. One, one is domain expertise. Uh, we, look, we look for people that, that have spent enough time providing value in a space um, that, that they're able to leverage that knowledge to do something much bigger and, and better uh, of higher order. And, and you and Shaker are an obvious example of that, of you know, what you've done in grocery. Um, and, the, and the other is a team that's worked together. And you know, that's, that's also coming back to bird's eye is something I saw from day one. You had Shaker and Volker and, and um, and, uh, and uh, Frank that have worked together for many, many years and right. can complete each other's sentences and know the strengths and weaknesses of each team member. And, and, um, and uh, you, you don't, yeah, as a venture capitalist, I don't like the risk of lacking domain expertise and, and uh, lacking team experience of working together because you could have domain expertise, but if you slam a team together that's never worked together, um, you know, it's going to explode possibly, right. potentially. And I've lived through that before. It's very painful. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you had Shaker, Frank and Volker at bird's eye. And, uh, but what they didn't have was the path to really truly have market credibility. And, and then they met you, Gary, and, and they solved for that major, major gap in, in their, um, in their domain expertise. So, uh, so that's it on team is domain expertise. And you've worked together to where you can, really complement each other. Okay, neat. No, neat. that's terrific. I mean, this is, you know, this is stuff that, uh, you know, nuggets for a lot of people who are thinking about starting starting businesses yeah. and what it takes to become successful and actually catch uh, the attention of somebody who's willing to invest. Uh, uh, so moving on, uh, David, uh, from a perspective, I mean, you know, we have next, you know, we're coming to the end of 2020. I mean, this is, can you believe it? Just the other day, it was Y2K. <laughs> And it's the end of 2020. Uh, so from a technology perspective and, uh, you know, if they were, if you had a, you know, the Nostradamus hat on, what would you say, you know, in, in three, four years, where do you see retail going? I mean, how do you think, what's going to change in the way we interact with stores? Well, I think the hard part of it has now finally been achieved which is you can shop with a brand or a retailer, or maybe it's a brand that is a retailer. Uh, you can now finally shop somewhat seamlessly, whether you're online or physically in the store in any mix of that. Those two things used to be totally separated. Uh, they finally have kind of congealed together to where you can have a pretty decent customer experience, whether you're shopping online or in the store or, or online while you're in the store or whatever. Um, but I think the next step, Shaker, 
I think the next frontier is really looking uh, not from the store to the transaction, uh, but looking from the store back to the source of the product. Uh, so I think really um, having visibility in the supply chain is the next frontier of really knowing where that food came from that you're putting in your mouth or really knowing the story of that pillow you just bought for your couch or that blanket you just bought. I mean, really knowing the story of how it was produced, what materials, was it organic? Was it fair labor? Was it, you know, was it clean? Uh, was it good to the earth or was it harmful to the earth? I think, I think that supply chain visibility is the next big frontier. Uh, and you guys are clearly playing into that with your wellness thoughts. Right. So, but so our latest that doesn't really... Um, well, maybe you'll let me talk about it next, but uh, our latest investment speaks to that. So that doesn't really matter whether you're selling online or in store. The point is you're saying right. there's a story behind the product and people are interested in knowing the story behind the product. And, and I guess there's a big trend of supporting local companies, local produce and, you know, local yeah. communities. And that, that's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, Where does this thing come from and does it align with my values? Yeah. I think right. that's the next big frontier. Yeah. Well, which plays to the authenticity sort of bucket of, of, uh, uh, capabilities that, that you spoke about a few minutes ago, and it's it's really this complete transparency across the supply chain. Right. Yeah. And you were going to move on with your story, you know, if I let you. What's, oh, what's yeah. Well, so, so supply chain transparency has been a theme for RevTech that we've spoken about, and we've done events around. We have an event coming up in a couple of weeks around a supply chain and, uh, and so supply chain transparency has been an ideal we've thought about, but we've looked at a hundred supply chain deals and none of them really spoke directly to transparency. And then uh, lo and behold, I was attending a plug and play event where they show you like 50 deals in, in uh, 90 minutes. And, and you just have this uh, uh, fire hose of deal flow coming in, but one of them, was a supply chain transparency deal and, uh, and utilizing blockchain, something you guys can relate to because you've thought about applications for blockchain in your work at Birdseye. Um, but uh, this one um, uh, just happened to be here in Texas out of Rice University. Hmm. And, and it just happened to be a women-led deal. And we just launched a new women-led venture fund at RevTech uh, looking for women-led startups. So it like it like if you're in the Vegas casino, it's like getting seven seven seven. <laughs> All the stars aligned. All at once, but uh, but what they're doing is utilizing blockchain uh, to uh, take all these different standards in electricity or energy. You have the Green E standard uh, in labor, um, trying to eliminate sweatshops around the world. You have Fair Labor standard. You have organic certified. You have all these standards. But the process of like confirming that product from the source of picking it off the vine to weighing it, to packaging it, to shipping it and going through two or three distribution layers before it goes to the final uh, grocery store where it's picked up by a consumer. Um, being able to verify that end-to-end -end transaction has been difficult to now, but what this company's done, they're called Topple and they're out of Houston. Uh, they, they've devised a, a digital twin of any physical commodity, whether it's coffee bean or a diamond. Uh, they've invented this uh, digital twin uh, that will follow that physical actual product, whether <clears throat> in coffee bean or diamond from being picked out of the mine or off the vine all the way to being consumed uh, by the consumer. <clears throat> And, uh, and it's really incredible. And they have two ways of going about it. One is a top down with ecosystems that are more controlled uh, where, uh, where the supply chain uh, uh, can push down through the system, the implementation of this, or the more uh, decentralized um, social aspect where they push it out through social media and just getting people to adopt it out of aspirational goals. Hmm. So very, very interesting wow. technology. Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Uh, and I think it's a billion dollar idea. We'll see if they can execute on it. Right. Neat. Right. 
So talking about execution, uh, David, uh, you know, you see uh, uh, executing on ideas and you see, I know, like you said, for every deal you get invested in, you've probably seen 100 deals, if not more. Uh, what, do you, what do you see as the difference between people who execute and who don't? Is there anything that stands out to you? Yeah, let me think about that a second. When you're, when you're doing a startup and you're bringing a solution to the world that the world needs, it's, it's like pushing a wagon up a steep hill. Uh, just, you know, there's so much friction uh, against you bringing your idea to the world. And, and, um, and I think what I see with entrepreneurs that can execute is, is um, a combination of persistence and, uh, and adaptation are the big ones. And, and I guess the third would be never taking the eye off the prize, which is what does the end goal look like? What does this look like when you get there? Because only if you have that clarity of what the end vision is, can you connect the dots back to where you are at the present moment? Yeah. So I, I'd say it's a combination of, of just like being unstoppable because the world's fighting against you every minute of every day. Uh, there's all friction from every point of people changing what they're doing now to, to adopting what you're going to bring that's going to make their life better. Um, so it's that persistence, it's that adaptation to being able to see ways you need to change your course to get to the goal and then never losing sight of the goal. That's, that's terrific stuff. Yeah. So coming back to a little bit of our world, you know, retail and grocery, you know, obviously last five, six years, Amazon has stepped into the field here, uh, David, and it's completely, uh, uh, Let's put it this way. It's on top of mind for most retailers uh, when they think about going to market and surviving oh, yeah. and becoming successful. So, you know, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the things that you think retailers have to do to kind of survive uh, this, uh, you know, this invasion, if you will? Amazon Armageddon. Right. <laughs> you ever read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's piece about David and Goliath? Yep. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a great example. The, I, I heard the story of David and Goliath from the Bible as a kid. And, and it's always framed like, you know, here's this guy going up against a monster and, and somehow, you know, he's able to persevere against all the odds. But the way Malcolm Gladwell tells it, well, David really had all the advantage he didn't put on all the armor, so he wasn't weighed down. He was light and able to move very nimbly. You know, he was a lot smaller. He used all his advantages. Goliath was like this massive, unmovable giant. Um, uh, and uh, and, um, and uh, really, the way Malcolm Gladwell tells it is uh, David had all the advantages, but he didn't play by the rules. He created the rules. And the rules were don't wear the armor, don't carry the sword, you know, be light, nimble, carry your slingshot and, and have a good aim. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, you know, David actually had the odds in his favor. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think I think of that way, really. You, you know, I, I, I think that's a good analogy. And, and certainly historically, that's been a good analogy. You know, when you think back to competing with an IBM or, you know, some of the other huge companies. In my mind, Amazon is a different animal, right? Amazon grew up as a innovation driven tech company. They have been agile from day one. And, you know, you, you read or from time to time, different things sort of come to light as to how that company operates, their management style, you know, their uh, team size uh, is limited to what two pizzas or something. Uh, you know they, they've got a, a number of different things that sound like they're ingrained in their management structure to reinforce that nimbleness and that that early thinking. So I, I, I think David and Goliath analogy is good, but but I think Amazon is a different animal in my <laughs> mind. Yeah. You know, I, I, think, I think there's something to learn, learn too. I think from for startups is to, 
uh, I think, you know, I think number one, I think any, any, any uh, enterprise that's purely motivated by fear is doomed to failure at some point because, uh, you know, it's only a, it's, it saps your energy, then gives you energy. You can't constantly be looking over your shoulder. Yeah. And I think like, like you, like you said, David, I think you got to keep your eye on the price. You got to be persistent. And if you believe enough in that end price, you figure it out one way or the other. Uh, well, you know, I, I the fully believe there's a million ways to beat Amazon. I mean, um, you know, it's been difficult for me raising money for a venture fund focused on retail tech. People say, why would you do that? Amazon is on its yeah. way to 100% market share. I mean, you're an exercise in futility. I'm like, right. No, they're 5% <laughs> market share, not right. 100%. Right, right. Yeah. And they're 5% and they're leveling off, by the way. Right, uh, right. But, you know, we were talking about the citizenry a few minutes ago. They would have been insane to do their product through Amazon because Amazon, with their marketplace, sees the best high rising ideas and they steal them. So, no best of class ideas are going to flow through the Amazon marketplace, only mediocre ideas. Right. By definition, if you right. have a great idea that's scaling, they will steal it and you'll right. be broke. You'll have nothing. Right. So, I mean, if you just think about it through that template, there's a million ways to beat Amazon because they're just a big 800 pound gorilla and, uh, and there's a lot of ways to uh, dance around them and beat them at their own game. But their yeah. game that's been successful by the way is that focus on the consumer and yes. making the life of the consumer better every year. Getting more selection, faster delivery, better quality relentlessly. But they can be beaten. They can absolutely be beaten. That's awesome. I mean, I think that's yeah. very encouraging words for people and retailers to hear out there yeah. and you know I, th I think one of the things that you know as a startup and I think as long as you keep, can preserve the startup mentality and the startup culture you always have the uh, you know the flexibility the agility to adapt uh, but yet like you say David you don't want to be making adjustments just because the weather today is bad you want something that's long term you're not but you yet have the capability to kind of you know duck the odd ball that's coming at you right uh, you don't want to be so static that you get hit by everything that comes along right yeah i'm not investing in any covid sterilization <laughs> technology. Like, okay well that works great about one year out of every yeah, hundred, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. thank you <laughs> that's, right. that's right that's right yeah yeah so gary anything else so i think no no I, this is a great is a uh, great discussion yeah yeah and this has been so different, honestly, David, because we've been talking for the last 11 episodes focused around retail technology. We've talked about loyalty, marketing, uh, personalization, AI, you know, a whole bunch of things, but getting a perspective, which is completely different, which is, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're building ideas, taking it to market, you know, uh, this has been fantastic. So I really appreciate your time here, but, you know, any, any closing words here for, um, uh, advice for any up and coming entrepreneurs, uh, you know, I got one looking more to thing raise we didn't get to, and, and you and Gary with bird's eye are a testament to it, but uh, my advice to entrepreneurs would be think about with your idea, creating a beachhead, think about who is that subset of the market. And it could be a very small subset. Who is that subset of the market that will die without your solution? And the way bird's eye went after the independent grocer, and uh, brought them technology and the path to digital. Uh, it's a great example of a beachhead. I mean, you guys are key to helping the independent grocer remain viable in the world of e-commerce. I'd advise that to every entrepreneur. I learned it from this book from Peter Thiel, one of the greatest VCs out yep. there in his book, Zero to One, is really find a beachhead where you can own the marketplace. Even if it's a million dollar total addressable market, if you can go own it, that's something to own and build out from. That's, that's big. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's great call out. No, I think that's great advice. That's fantastic. So, hey, listen, I, I know the time flew by fast here. This has been a fun conversation. I'm sure we'll have David back on the show here oh, in, yes. in the next few months uh, as we get through this period and the world changes here after November. Uh, it's been fantastic having you on the show. You know, uh, we. Hope you'll come back again and all the best to all those companies that you talked about, David. It seems extremely exciting and congratulations to RevTech Ventures again. And uh, Gary, any, anything, 
uh, to close this out. No, David, thanks for being with us. Great conversation. And we'll look forward to having you back again soon. Yeah, Great. and to all of you guys out there. Thanks, thanks for listening. And we'll be back uh, next week. Bye. All right. Cheers. Yeah. Happy Thank Friday. you. All right, David. Join us every good. Monday and connect with us at The Retail Perch on Instagram and Facebook. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us at theretailperch at birdseye.com.